Joseph Atwill in Caesar's Messiah holds that the entire Christian religion was invented from whole cloth by the Romans in the last years of the first century, with the involvement of Josephus and that there had been no Christianity before the 66 to 73 AD Judeo-Roman war. The motivation was to replace the Jewish longing for a martial earthly messiah that so vexed the Romans with a messiah friendly to the Roman cause, i.e. Emperor Titus disguised as Jesus. He also says that the Gospels were written as a satire, or lampoon as he puts it, of the campaign of Titus as he continued to prosecute the war against the Jews after his father Vespasian had left for Rome to become emperor. To make this case, Atwill capitalises on the well-known pro-Roman stance of the New Testament. This is familiar territory, with give unto Caesar what is Caesar's, and the Roman centurion at the crucifixion scene being the only person in Mark's Gospel who understands who Jesus is, aside from the reader, the writer, Jesus, the unclean spirits and God. There are many other examples too. The received narrative does not have a problem explaining this. It is a consequence of the selection of groups to survive by the Romans and pressure to comply with Rome within groups. Jewish sects at the time included the Essenes, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, who were fairly neutral towards Rome, Christians who were friendly and militants like the Sicarian zealots who were murderously hostile. The overwhelming power of Rome at the time ensured that the latter groups were erased from history, the former were tolerated and the Christians were favoured. Therefore, whatever the motivations for favouring Rome, it's hardly surprising that the religions that survived were either neutral or positive towards it. And in the case of Christians, their prospects of survival while at loggerheads with Judaism would have been thin indeed without currying favour with Rome. Nothing beyond this is required to explain the stance of the New Testament. Another matter is that of figures mentioned by early Christian chroniclers who may have been high-ranking Romans. Both Romans and Jews tended to use the same names over and over again, which is why there are so many Jesuses, Simons and Mary among the Jews, and Agrippas, Octavias and Marcuses amongst the Romans. Christianity's appeal and accessibility to Gentiles meant that many Roman names appear in early accounts, and there has been much debate about whether people recorded by early Christians with the same name as those recorded by Roman accounts were the same people. So, for example, Clement of Rome was one of the first four popes. In the 19th century, it was widely believed that Clement of Rome was the same person as the Roman consul Titus Flavius Clemens, mentioned by Cassius Dio, but this is no longer thought to be the case. St. Domitilla is another example. Cassius Dio tells us that Flavia Domitilla married Titus Flavius Clemens. Clemens was executed and she was banished for leaning towards Judaism. There are many such examples, and the received position has varied on them. Roman government theorists like Atwill typically present these cases and side with the Roman identification of them, without discussing the current view on whether they were really the same people. These two points about the pro-Roman stance of the New Testament and Romans in early Christian history are common to all writers who propose a Roman government origin for Christianity. What's novel about Atwill's book is his proposal of extensive parallels between Christian and Roman sources. He draws a parallel between Christian expansionism and inclusion of everybody and the Roman government's expansionist policy and practice. Then the earliest Christian writings are in Greek, the lingua franca of the Eastern Roman Empire, not Aramaic or Hebrew. First Clement dating from perhaps the 90s AD, uses Roman military parallels and indicates that the Bishop of Rome was able to dictate orders to the church in Corinth. Titus managed to persuade the Senate with some difficulty to make his late father a god. He also did this with his sister Donatella and he therefore was a religion maker and was the son of a god. Further, Tacitus tells us that Vespasian cured a man's blindness and another man with an arm complaint. Atwill quotes a few other disparate parallels like this, but most of his parallels are between the New Testament and War of the Jews by Josephus. For example, he says that Jesus told his followers he would make them fishers of men, while standing at the same spot on the shore of the Sea of Galilee where Titus won a battle between a group of Jews led by a man called Jesus, and this battle involved fishing for men. 
Another War of the Jews parallel is between the rather grisly story in Josephus of a Jewish woman called Mary starving from the siege who cooks and eats her child with conceptual parallels with the Eucharist. A third concerns the itinerary of Jesus during his ministry as recounted by Luke being an exact parallel of the itinerary of Titus during his campaign with 34 claimed points of commonality, all in the same order. These are three out of scores of parallels that Atwill comes up with, but there is little purpose in discussing them one by one, because his defective method is common to all. Caesar's Messiah is a long book, at over 400 pages, but a weak argument is not made strong by repeating it a hundred times. Parallels take special care to interpret and require a diversion into cognitive processes. Psychologists divide cognition into two types, referred to as System 1 and System 2, or automatic and analytic. Automatic cognition is based on learned responses to familiar situations. It is fast, easy and subconscious. These learned responses are called heuristics, and numerous heuristics have been described, but particularly relevant here are the anchoring heuristic, which is a tendency to continue with an initial judgment despite new information opposing it, and the confirmation heuristic, which is a tendency to actively seek evidence that supports a chosen position rather than evidence that refutes it. Automatic cognition is based on pattern recognition, and its typical errors are recognising a pattern that's not there, and recognising the wrong pattern. A good example of this is our tendency to see faces in clouds. We have less of a tendency to see wheels in clouds. We see those faces not because the clouds resemble faces more than wheels, but rather because we have a heuristic to recognise patterns similar to faces as faces, and we have no heuristic to recognise wheels. Although it seems Ezekiel at least did have such a heuristic. System 2, or analytic cognition, is rational thought which is conscious, slow and requires effort, but has the ability to understand and interpret situations that we have no prior experience of. Unlike automatic cognition, it can be communicated to others in language or mathematical symbols, allowing the merits of arguments based on analytic cognition to be discussed and judged. The relevance here is that finding parallels is a form of pattern recognition. We have an automatic, intuitive tendency to see parallels, and when seen to stick to those parallels and specifically seek evidence that supports them. This makes arguments involving parallels intuitively persuasive, but we need to be careful when assessing them to avoid the problems of heuristic biases and demand analytic, rather than simply heuristic, justifications for them. This particularly applies to deciding whether a parallel is due to someone's deliberate intention, such as in this face, or to over-eager heuristic interpretation of random patterns, as in this face. This is done using the statistical null hypothesis approach. Here, the null hypothesis is that the parallels between the New Testament and Josephus are the random similarities you would expect when comparing two volumes of literature which were written at the same time by people with the same cultural and religious background and in the aftermath of the same destructive war. Research now involves calculating the likelihood of parallels arising by chance. This is no mean feat, but in one case there is an easy shortcut. That case is of textual similarity. A Google search for the phrase Josephus finished War of the Jews on 16th of June 2021 found no hits. Considering the millions of words written about the subject, that's perhaps rather remarkable, but it illustrates the vast number of permutations of words and letters that are possible. These permutations can be calculated, allowing us to estimate the likelihood of particular phrases appearing by chance. With the relatively small volume of ancient literature we have, those likelihoods are pretty low, even for small phrases, which is why we can be confident that many of the New Testament phrases that have similar Old Testament precedents did not arise by chance, but by copying. But Adwill's parallels do not use textual similarity. They are almost all conceptual parallels, with only a couple of textual parallels, and those involve only one word, such as Jesus or Mary. 
Conceptual similarity is similarity of ideas rather than similarity in the use of words. That's problematic because we have strong heuristics to see conceptual parallels and also they are more difficult to bring under the guns of statistics than are textual parallels. Any approach to this starts with carefully defining categories of concepts and then sticking rigidly to those definitions when categorising parallel concepts. What it absolutely does not involve is identifying a parallel between two texts and arbitrarily defining categories of concept post hoc in order to include both. As we'll see, Atwill does the latter and not the former. Instead of discussing why these parallels are not pure coincidence, or are expected under theories other than his that the Roman government invented Christianity, he simply reinforces the argument by coming up with more and more parallels. These are appeals to the type-matching heuristics of our System 1 cognition with no appeal to analytics. He takes that as being enough to be persuasive, but of course it's not. His parallels in cases may be appealing, but we know from cognitive psychology that that is exactly the kind of appeal not to trust. In his Fishers of Men parallel, Atwill cites this passage from War of the Jews. This lake is called by the people of the country the Lake of Gennesareth. They had a great number of ships, and they were so fitted up that they might undertake a sea fight. But as the Romans were building a wall about their camp, Jesus and his party made a sally upon them. Sometimes the Romans leaped into their ships with their swords in their hands and slew them, but when some of them met the vessels, the Romans caught them by the middle and destroyed at once their ships and themselves who were taken in them. And for such as were drowning in the sea, if they lifted their heads up above the water, they were either killed by darts or caught by the vessels. But if, in the desperate case they were in, they attempted to swim to their enemies, the Romans cut off either their heads or their hands. Atwell has edited out a large majority of the text which describes the battle, a small part of which involved combatants in vessels on the lake, and a small part of that involved Romans killing Jews who were actually in the water. This is the original chapter with the bits Atwell used highlighted to illustrate the degree of his editing. There is some conceptual overlap between fishing and killing soldiers swimming in the water, but there is no hint of this overlap given in either Josephus or the Gospels. And this overlap is pretty strained. The soldiers were being killed as enemies, not hunted for the nutritional value of their bodies. The Gospel statement is based on a career change, fishers of men being used because they were fishermen. Had they been, say, software engineers, Jesus would have said, come, I will make you programmers of men. The fishing bit had nothing to do with their final career, but their initial career and neither career had anything to do with killing enemies. There are two parallels between the New Testament and Josephus scenes that are not contrived. The location of the event and a leader called Jesus. Jesus probably is a coincidence. It was a common name. In his writings, Josephus mentions eight people called Jesus, and this Jesus was leading the losers, not the winners. The location is also overstated as a parallel by Atwill, who claims Jesus made his disciples fishers of men and Titus killed the swimming soldiers on the very same beach. All that can be determined from the texts is that both events occurred on the northwestern shore of Lake Galilee, which was the most populated shore, and so is not such a surprise. Atwell treats his other parallels in the same way, with appeals to attractive heuristics by saying things like, this can't possibly be a coincidence, with no discussion of why not, or why other theories about the origin of Christianity may also be compatible with the apparent parallel. Not all of Atwell's arguments involve parallels, though. He justifies his claim that the Gospels are a cruel satire of the campaign of Titus with an argument about the sequence of events at the empty tomb. He uses times of day as timestamps to put the events from the four Gospels into chronological sequence. For example, Mary Magdalene turns up while it's still dark in John and again at the crack of dawn in Mark. 
As Will works out how many visiting disciples are variously inside or outside the tomb, then equals these numbers with the angels and Jesus seen inside and outside the tomb, so as to argue that the intention of the Gospel writers was to show that the appearances of angels and Jesus were really the tomb attendants confusing each other with angels and Jesus. It is an interesting idea, but it requires Simon and Peter to be two people, one called Simon and one called Simon Peter. Also, for Mary Magdalene to be two people. Atwell goes on to argue that there must have been more than one Jesus that the Gospels were referring to, using a similar method of pointing out inconsistencies between the Gospels' say about who did what and when, making it impossible for them all to be strictly true unless there's more than one person involved. Interesting but unconvincing, and too reliant on an exact literal interpretation of the various Gospel accounts. A final interesting point is at will on the Testimonium Flavianum. This is from Josephus' Antiquities of the Jews, not the Jewish War. In it, Josephus says, About this time there lived Jesus, a wise man, if indeed one ought to call him a man, for he was one who performed surprising deeds and was a teacher of such people as accept the truth gladly. He won over many Jews and many of the Greeks. He was the Messiah. And when, upon the accusation of the principal men among us, Pilate had condemned him to the cross, those who had first come to love him did not cease. He appeared to them, spending a third day restored to life, for the prophets of God had foretold these things, and a thousand other marvels about him. And the tribe of Christians, so called after him, has still to this day not disappeared. This passage is followed by two stories, the first being of Decius Mundus, who recruits wicked priests to help him seduce a woman in the temple by pretending to be the god Anubis, and tells her three days later that he was not the god after all. The second story is of a Jewish miscreant who was driven out of Judea by other Jews for breaking their laws, and came to live in Rome as a Jewish scholarly pretender. He collaborated with three other similar Jewish miscreants and persuaded a woman of good standing to send purple and gold to help the temple in Jerusalem. They diverted the gifts for themselves, resulting in the wrath of Tiberius and the expulsion of 4,000 Jews from Rome. Atwill argues that there are clues in Josephus showing that these three stories are to be read together as a riddle. And his solution to that riddle is Rome wanted Judea but was unable to buy its loyalty with money because of the strong religious convictions of the Jews. So a Roman deceives a Jewish group into believing that he is the Messiah and he recruited wicked priests to assist with this deception, the priests being the Christians. He goes on to enjoy the benefits of being or being associated with the Messiah. And Atwell then associates the unnamed Jewish miscreant who professed to instruct men in the wisdom of the laws of Moses with Paul. Caesar's Messiah is an engaging book. It's a racy read of plotting and subterfuge that puts the church in a bad light and has Christians down the ages worshipping Caesar rather than God. But it's not scholarship and it's not convincing. There is a caution to note, though. Intuitive insights cannot be directly communicated to others and have to be translated into analytical language for an author to make their case. There are people who had intuitive insights but lacked the knowledge or resources to translate them into convincing analytical language and were therefore rejected, but whose intuitions were later shown to be true. They were visionaries, but for every visionary there must be at least a hundred cranks.